Jean-Luc Picard is one of Star Trek's most legendary captains, but the man has a long, complicated history with the Enterprise and its crew. If you want the lowdown on his story, then here's Picard's entire timeline explained. Born in La Barre, France, young Jean-Luc Picard had a troubled upbringing. The first glimpse of his childhood comes in the Star Trek The Next Generation episode titled Family, where he visits his brother Robert on Earth. In this episode, we learn that Jean-Luc and Robert helped their father take care of the family's vineyards. We also learn that the rest of Jean-Luc's family are traditionalists. They don't trust advanced technology like replicators and certainly don't have a high opinion of the vaunted Starfleet. All the while, his brother is something of a bully to him. But we learn much more about the young Picard's early life in Season 2 of Star Trek Picard. Apparently, he had an especially close relationship with his mother, Yvette. But Yvette suffered from severe mental illness, and despite her husband Maurice's pleas, she refused to seek help. As a result, Maurice is often forced to lock her in her room to prevent her from self-harm during particularly difficult episodes. This leads to one of the most life-altering moments in Jean-Luc's life. Amid one of his mother's episodes, she calls out to Jean-Luc to let her out of her room. When he does, it leads to his mother's suicide. Picard carries the guilt of this incident with him all of his life, only finally coming to terms with it as an older man. Moving past the tragedy, Jean-Luc's time on the family vineyard continues to frustrate him, as he has little interest in the family business of winemaking. It doesn't take long for Jean-Luc to figure out that his path leads to the stars, and the future Enterprise captain soon gains a reputation as an overachiever, becoming a sports champion as well as valedictorian of his high school. The thought president of the school valedictorian, athletic hero with your arms raised in victory. Against his father's wishes, Jean-Luc leaves home for Starfleet Academy as soon as the opportunity arises, though it takes him two attempts before his application is accepted. In Season 6's Tapestry, we learn a little bit more about what kind of man he is during his Academy days. Far from the steady, stoic, commanding leader, Picard is a brash, fiery cavalier sort, and even something of a womanizer while at Starfleet Academy. It's there that he meets both Jack Crusher and Beverly Howard, and they become close friends. We also learn that he had something of an unrequited crush on Academy mate Marta Botanides. But we also witnessed an event just after his exit from the Academy that leaves its deepest mark on him. While waiting for his first assignments, Picard gets into a brawl with a group of Nausicans over a game of Dom Jot. Overmatched but refusing to back down, Picard is stabbed through the heart, and while he survives the injury, he's left with an artificial organ in his heart's place. We don't have many details about Picard's post-Academy life before he got command of his own ship. We learn in the second season TNG episode, The Measure of a Man, that he once served aboard the USS Reliant, but more is known about his time aboard the USS Stargazer. There, Picard started as a bridge officer, but he made his way up the ranks the old-fashioned way, being the highest-ranked officer left alive in the middle of a battle. Jean-Luc commanded the Stargazer for two decades until he and the surviving crew were forced to abandon the vessel after a battle with a Ferengi ship. Who are they? Identify them. They're turning for a third pass at us, sir. We can't take another hit, Captain. That final battle led to the Picard maneuver being coined for the unorthodox move Jean-Luc made to destroy the enemy vessel. More personally relevant to Picard was his friendship with Jack Crusher aboard the Stargazer. Jack was the late husband of Beverly Crusher and father to Wesley, both of whom wind up serving aboard the Enterprise. It's Picard who, while commanding the Stargazer, sent Jack Crusher on an away mission that led to his death. When we meet Picard in the Next Generation series premiere, he's already taken command of his famous ship. His orders send him to Deneb IV. Beyond which lies the great, unexplored mass of the galaxy. On the way there, the Enterprise has its first fateful meeting with the trickster, godlike alien Q. With a few short breaks here and there, Picard remains in command of the Enterprise-D until its destruction in 1994's Star Trek Generations. He and his stalwart crew get to explore quite a bit of that great unexplored mass, and along the way they encounter aliens both benevolent and hostile, including the fan favorite Borg. In the Season 2 episode Q Who, the deceitful Q uses his powers to send the Enterprise deep into unexplored parts of the galaxy where they encounter the Borg for the first time. The Borg act as a single collective mind and rebuff all attempts at communication in favor of seeking to overpower the Enterprise. Although they're eventually returned to Federation space, it's clear the crew hasn't seen the last of the Borg. Since they're aware of your existence, 
They will be coming. The Borg re-emerge in the two-parter The Best of Both Worlds when they kidnap Picard and assimilate him into their collective. Picard is eventually rescued and it proves the Borg's Achilles' heel as his connection to the collective allows Data to command the invaders to sleep. But it's clear Picard is severely traumatized by the experience. This wouldn't be Picard's last encounter with the Borg, however. In I, Borg, the Enterprise crew rescue a Borg who's somehow capable of independent thought. They meet him again in the two-part Descent as the leader of a group of liberated Borg resisting the control of Data's twin brother, Lore. And finally, Picard would be forced to confront the Borg and his overwhelming need for vengeance against them in 1996's Star Trek First Contact, when the aliens attempt to assimilate the Federation by going back in time before the Federation's founding. One of the most interesting relationships on Star Trek The Next Generation is the kinship that develops between Picard and the android Data. By the end of the series and the subsequent films, it's clear Picard holds the android close to his heart. He sees Data as, at the very least, a close friend. However, at times their connection doesn't seem all that different than that between a father and a son. Picard reveals part of his fascination with and admiration for Data in the second season episode The Measure of a Man. Data attempts to resign his commission so that an insistent Starfleet scientist can't run experiments on him, which will wipe out his memory. The scientist argues Data, as a machine, doesn't have the right to resign his commission, and Picard assumes the difficult task of proving that Data is a sentient being, with the right to make his own choices and not be subjected to anyone else's ownership. Picard famously tells the presiding judge, Your Honor, Starfleet was founded to seek out new life. Well, there it sits. Data is tragically forced to sacrifice himself at the end of the final Next Generation film, 2002's Star Trek Nemesis. When Picard is appointed as Arbiter of Succession by the dying Klingon Chancellor Kempek, he helps alter the course of the Klingon Empire. As Arbiter, Picard's job is to weigh the worth of the two challengers, Galron and Duras. By the end of Season 4's reunion, Kempek is dead, and no new Chancellor has been officially announced. Things get even more complicated when Worf, claiming vengeance for the death of his mate, Kalar, at Duras's hands, transports over to Duras's ship and kills him. Picard finally announces Gowron as the rightful Chancellor, but two Klingon sisters from the House of Duras appear with a boy named Toral, who they claim is the son of Duras and should therefore be considered a challenger in the right. Picard later confirms Toral is the son of Duras, but that he is too young and inexperienced to be considered Chancellor. The decision pushes the Klingon Empire into open civil war. Eventually, the House of Duras's conspiracy with the Romulans is exposed and Gowron presides over a reunited empire. As an added benefit, Worf and his house are redeemed in the eyes of his people. In spite of their respective series being separated by two decades, Jean-Luc Picard proves to be an important figure in the life of Spock. The first time Picard significantly touches Spock's life is in the third season's Sarek. Spock himself doesn't appear, but his father Sarek boards the Enterprise to negotiate a trade deal with the Lagarans. Unfortunately, it soon becomes clear that Sarek suffers from a rare degenerative disorder that causes his emotions to run wild. Picard agrees to a mind meld so that Sarek can maintain enough control to continue with the negotiations. My mind to your mind. In the two-part unification, Picard comes face to face with Spock himself. He's sent to Romulus to find Spock because Starfleet fears the Vulcan may have defected to their rivals. Instead, Picard learns Spock is involved in secret negotiations with the hopes of bringing the Vulcan and Romulan people back together. By the end of the two-parter, Sarek finally succumbs to his illness, and unification ends with a compassionate and tender gesture on Picard's part. He allows Spock to mind meld with him so that Spock may connect with the parts of his father that Picard had experienced. Of all the Star Trek series of the past six decades, none can boast as inventive or satisfying a finale as All Good Things, the final episode of The Next Generation. Q causes Picard to jump both backwards and forwards in time so that the story takes place in the present, past, and decades in the future, where Picard is an older man suffering from a degenerative mental disease. Picard's trips to the future are particularly difficult. With future versions of Beverly Crusher, Data, and Geordi LaForge all aware of his condition, it makes it that much more challenging to convince anyone in that time that he actually is experiencing what he says he's experiencing. I know what you're thinking, it's the Eremotic Syndrome. He's beginning to lose his mind, the old man. Well, it's not that, and I'm not daydreaming either. None of the TNG movies hinted towards the illness beginning to emerge, and the future of the episode was only one possible timeline. 
When the Next Generation crew gets on the big screen for the first time in 1994's Star Trek Generations, it sadly comes with the death of William Shatner's Captain Kirk. And unfortunately, Jean-Luc Picard suffers some much more personal losses, both in the beginning and at the end of the game-changing film. Early in Generations, the Enterprise's empathic counselor, Deanna Troy, senses something is terribly wrong, and when she finds Captain Picard flipping through a photo album, Jean-Luc reveals he's just received news that his brother Robert and his son have been killed in a fire. The usually stoic Picard laments the loss of his beloved nephew and reflects that without a wife or children of his own, he'll be the last one in his family line. I had come to feel that Rene was as close as I would get to having a child of my own. By the end of the movie, Picard loses the Enterprise itself. The ship barely survives a battle with a Klingon bird of prey run by the villainous sisters Lursa and Bator. The crew evacuates to the ship's saucer section, which crashes on the surface of Viridian 3. Thankfully, as Picard predicts, the Enterprise-D won't be the last ship to carry the name Enterprise. The final big-screen appearance of Jean-Luc Picard comes with 2002's Star Trek Nemesis. The Enterprise is sent to Romulus to meet the Romulan Empire's new leader, who we soon learn has an unexpected connection to Picard. As it turns out, Praetor Shinzon is a clone of Jean-Luc. The Romulans cloned the captain in hopes of one day replacing him with their own identical agent. But when one of the Empire's many power shifts took place, the clone was sent to a labor colony with the enslaved people of Remus. Shinzon lures Picard to Romulus because the cloning process that created him is now killing him, and his only potential cure is a complete blood transfusion with Picard. Ultimately, Shinzon's plans to kill Picard and destroy the Federation are foiled, and the clone villain dies fighting his older counterpart. On top of all that, Nemesis includes huge shifts in Picard's life, including the loss of Riker as his number one. We learn early in the film that Riker is finally taking the captain's chair on the USS Titan, and his new wife Deanna Troy is coming with him. Picard means for Data to replace Riker as his first officer, but the android sacrifices himself to save his friends in the final battle. In anticipation of Star Trek Picard, IDW released the prequel miniseries Star Trek Picard Countdown. The story takes place six years after the events of Nemesis and 14 years before Picard. Picard is an admiral commanding the USS Verity, Romulus' star is close to going supernova, and the Romulan Empire abandons some of its usual paranoia and secrecy for Starfleet's help. Unfortunately, complications arise when Picard travels to the Romulan colony of Yuyat Beta. The Romulans there have enslaved the native population and neglected to tell Starfleet because, in the words of one of the colony's Romulan leaders, evacuating them would be as ridiculous as evacuating the rocks and trees. When Picard refuses to relocate the Romulans without the natives, the colony's leaders take him and his first officer prisoner. Countdown gives us a chance to see Rafi Musiker, the irreverent first officer who insists on referring to Picard as JL, in action as Picard's second-in-command during the Romulan evacuation. We also meet the Romulans Zaban and Laris while they're still Tal Shiar agents, and it's revealed exactly how they eventually come to work for and live with Picard. After the events of Countdown are resolved, Picard and Rafi prepare to scramble a massive fleet to relocate the population of the twin Romulan homeworlds. The fleet is assembled at the Utopia Planitia shipyards with a workforce of mostly android synths. In a shocking turn of events, however, a plot masterminded by a Romulan splinter group orchestrates a synth uprising in a historical attack on Mars. The assault destroys the entire Romulan rescue armada. Picard does manage to get some Romulan refugees moved to the planet Vashti. However, the destruction of the fleet leaves his relocation plan in tatters and results in a ban on synthetic life forms. Desperate to fulfill his promise to rescue the Romulan people, Picard makes a plea to Starfleet. He wants to assemble a fleet of formerly mothballed ships and threatens to resign if they refuse. But in a shocking twist, Starfleet Command accepts his resignation. Haunted by his failures and unable to muster the same kind of respect he had in his prime, Picard leaves Starfleet behind and goes into seclusion at his vineyard. He relocates a number of Romulan refugees to his home, including his Romulan friends Laris and Zaban. Trekkies were surprised when they tuned in to Picard for the first time. Instead of the bold, commanding captain they recalled from TNG, they saw a dreary, tired old man. Following his failure to save Romulus, Picard spends more than a decade living a solitary life. 
He has only infrequent visits with old friends from his days on the Enterprise and the Stargazer, but his quiet life in France is upended by the arrival of a young woman named Dodge. This visitor appears to be the offspring of his old friend Data, and she's being hunted by mysterious unknown forces. Because everything inside of me says that I'm safe with you. As it turns out, Dodge is actually a synthetic life form, and she may be the key to stopping an emerging galactic threat. Without the clout he had in his heyday, Picard is forced to recruit a new crew. This includes Dr. Agnes Gerardi, rogue pilot Cristobal Rios, a young Romulan monk named Elnor, and his old friend Rafi. They take on a mission to unravel a conspiracy and stop a cosmic cataclysm. After several detours, he finally finds the destination of Dodge's twin sister. She's working at the Borg Reclamation Project. There, Picard is reunited with the former Borg drone named Hugh, who's taken it upon himself to assist other Borg to regain their former lives. More than just another chance to play hero, Picard's mission also allows him to finally come to terms with the death of Commander Data. While the story in Season 1 of Star Trek Picard is kicked off by the discovery of Data's daughter, the action is propelled by a mystery involving the synths and a threat that could wipe out all life in the galaxy. From his Romulan housekeepers, Picard learns that the threat may involve the Jat Vosh. To get to the bottom of the conspiracy, Picard and the crew of Captain Rios's La Serena must track down the scientist Bruce Maddox. The mission is completely unsanctioned, and it makes Picard a rogue agent in an unlikely role reversal. During the mission, Picard meets Dodge's twin sister, Soji, and is reunited with old friends Will Riker and Deanna Troy for the first time in many years. They help get him information regarding a planet called Capellius. It's there that a new race of synthetic life forms is being created, which the Zot Vosh believe poses an existential threat to the galaxy. As the planet comes under attack from a Romulan fleet, Picard gets assistance from Riker, who commands a Federation fleet, to stop them. In the aftermath, Picard successfully convinces convinces Starfleet to lift the ban on synthetic life, allowing Soji and others like them to live in peace. The end of the first season of Picard includes a life-altering change in the story of the former captain of the Enterprise. In the aftermath of the Romulan Federation clash in the skies above Capellius, Picard finally succumbs to the apparent eromotic syndrome that has long plagued him, and he dies surrounded by his new crew. But on Capellius, Picard gets a second chance at life. Also on Capellius is Data's human brother, Elton Soong, who has created a bio-organic golem body. With the help of Gerardi, Soong is able to transfer Picard's consciousness into this new golem, which is given the form of Picard's old body. Before the transfer completes, though, Picard's mind is transferred into a simulation module, where the consciousness of Data also resides. As Picard and Data speak, Picard's old friend makes one final request. When you leave, I would be profoundly grateful if you terminated my consciousness." Resurrected in his new body, Picard enters the simulation again and says a tearful goodbye as he shuts down Data's program one final time. In his new body, Jean-Luc Picard still has the form of an elderly man, but is free of his eromotic syndrome. Healthy enough to live decades more, he sets out with a renewed spirit and returns to active Starfleet duty. He's accepted back into the service and appointed to the role of Chancellor of Starfleet Academy. As season two of Picard begins, Jean-Luc's life has begun to settle down again, but an old rival shows up to make trouble. It turns out to be the not-so-immortal Q in season two of Star Trek Picard. Much like he has in the past, Q arrives to teach Picard a valuable life lesson, and he does it by throwing Picard and his new crew into an alternate timeline, where Starfleet is a fascist dictatorship and Picard is their iron-fisted tyrant ruler. Through a mirror darkly. And here the man who holds the glass is darker still. In this twisted reality, the Federation is known as the Confederation, and Picard has defeated all of its greatest enemies. This includes luminaries from Star Trek, including Klingon General Martok, Cardassian Gold Dukat, even beheading Sarek, director of the Vulcan Science Academy. Picard has to travel back in time to save the future. To solve the mystery of altered existence, Picard needs the help of the Borg Queen, he also has to come face to face with his own history when he meets Rene Picard. She's an ancestor of Jean Luc's, who also plays a key role in the history of space exploration in the 21st century. Her mission to Europa is critical to ensuring the Federation's future. 
Season 3 of Star Trek Picard was heavily promoted as the reunion of the crew of the Enterprise D, and it's because of an emerging threat from one of the Federation's most deadly foes. After using the USS Titan to come to the rescue of his dear friend and on again, off again lover Beverly Crusher, Picard uncovers a conspiracy to infiltrate the Federation. The threads begin to unravel as they encounter a mercenary pirate named Vodic. She is one of the leaders of the conspiracy, and the first foe Picard and his allies have to defeat in order to bring an end to the emerging threat. Vodic is a rogue changeling who spent much of her life as a prisoner and was tortured by Section 31 following the end of the Dominion War. She's bent on revenge and needs Picard's son to achieve it. With the help of the Titan's jaded captain, Liam Shaw, and his first officer, Seven of Nine, they help keep his son safe, but the reasons for the pursuit remain unclear. Season 3 of Star Trek Picard introduces Jack Crusher, the son of Jean-Luc Picard and Beverly Crusher, whose discovery forever alters Jean-Luc Picard's life. He is the product of a whirlwind romance following the events of Star Trek Nemesis. Dr. Crusher hid him from Picard because she feared he might become the target of his father's worst enemies. To keep him a secret, Dr. Crusher cut off all contact with Jean-Luc and the rest of her old Enterprise shipmates. Alongside his mother, Jack grew up on the edges of the Federation frontier, helping to provide aid and supplies to those in need. But they came under attack from what would later be revealed to be enemy changeling agents, and they were forced to go to Jean-Luc for help. Picard is heartbroken that he had been denied the opportunity to be a father for more than 20 years. And you never thought, if you had told me, it all might have been different. Despite the years of secrecy, Picard helps keep Dr. Crusher and Jack safe from their pursuers. With the aid of Riker, Picard hijacks the USS Titan to do it and exposes the Changeling plot. Ultimately, it's revealed that Jack inherited a part of Jean-Luc's Borg-assimilated biology. The Changeling, Vodic, was working with the Borg Queen to use Jack as part of a plan to assimilate and destroy the Federation. As Vox, Jack controls the newly created Borg drones and almost destroys Earth. But after Picard makes a heartfelt plea to his son within the Borg collective unconscious, Jack rejects the Queen, and the pair thwart her diabolical plans.